और You should be feel free to share the screen now. Sure. Can you see it okay? Yes. Oh, perfect. By the way, you should feel free to send all the seminar information to any people you would like to invite them to. to oh, uh, because I, I don't know. I, I mean, how to do the enough advertisement. So I'll just try. So many Thanks. Things. Thanks. Uh, I think my, uh, my parents will be bored after two minutes. So. <laughs> oh, I see you. Whatever co your colleagues. No. Yeah, no. I, 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 <laughs> Parents, I, I do I do prepare something for your parents. <laughs> well, it's recorded, so that's the thing. Many people will watch, watch recording, not attend live. Sure. So uh, you have 19 minutes, so maybe we can uh, gradually start. Sure. It's fun to have yeah. more time yeah. to explain. Yeah. Welcome, everyone. You can hear me, right? Welcome to Harvard CMSA Quantum Mapping Math and Physics Seminar Series. Today, we are honored to have a, a Ophrey Talon from UC Berkeley 
uh, he pre previously studied at the uh, Hebrew University and Technium, uh, and then did his PhD. He worked at the Cornell University, currently at UC Berkeley, and his topic today will be more exact resource in data theory, confinement and tyrosinous breaking uh, related talks was a few weeks ago by um, Toshi Murana. So uh, let's like welcome him. So they are kind of strong, I'm not talking to Baba yet. Uh, please uh, just welcome and also the audience, please uh, really feel free to interrupt. If you feel the discussion wasn't as interesting as you want, you should really just interact because it's because your participation makes the seminar successful. So, Toda Baba, please take it. So, yours. Thank you. So that for you too. Uh, and thanks for the, the honor and the invitation to speak. And this is a topic that's been pretty exciting for me in the recent few months um, since I started working on this with Itoshi and Shaba, my dear collaborators. Uh, and this is actually sort of a number two in a series. Uh, and the first uh, talk was given by Itoshi a few weeks ago. And uh, the main idea here is that there's a new avenue to learn about non-supersymmetric gauge theory by doing a controlled extrapolation from the supersymmetric limit using anomaly mediated supersymmetry breaking. And I'll hope I'll be able to convey to you once again, um, this was also conveyed in Hitoshi's talk, why uh, using AMSB is an outside the box idea that allows us to be much more predictive when going away from the SUSY limit as compared to starting with a SUSY gauge theory and introducing gauge mediation or um, similar ways of breaking SUSY. So um, this point will come up in the first part of the talk before I go, go into the specific application here, which is demonstrating confinement and chiral symmetry breaking in SON theories. So please, if you don't understand this take home point of why AMSV is um, different and more predictive, please feel free to stop me so I could convey this in a better way. And this is uh, following two papers that we submitted um, kind of one after another. One of them is a longer version and the other is a PRL version, uh, basically uh, informing that we are able to see confinement and chiral symmetry breaking in uh, near SUSY, but non SUSY setting. So here's the talk plan. And first I'll try to convey uh, why uh, we use AMSB to extrapolate um, into uh, study the IR structure of uh, non-supersymmetric gauge theory. And then we'll focus on the particular application that I'm demonstrating here, which is studying the phases of SON gauge theory. I'll first motivate why we even care about SON because famously we know that QCD in nature is SU3. Um, and yet looking at SON could teach us a lot about nature as well. Then I'll give a short recap of uh, the brilliant work by uh, Seiberg and Trilligator and collaborators in the 90s that exposed the IR structure of um, the supersymmetric version of SON theories. Then I'll use our tool of AMSB and I'll explicitly demonstrate monopole condensation as well as uh, global symmetry breaking in away from the SUSY limit of the SON theory. And in the end, we'll talk about line operators and what our diagnostics for confinement are. And finally, we'll have an outlook uh, and see what general lessons we can discern from this exercise. Good. So our entire construction can be summarized in this uh, four blob diagram. So uh, taking the UV, a UV non susy gauge theory and directly learning about its IR structure, what, um, what are its composites, for example, what, what its spectrum is, what global symmetries are respected and broken in the IR, is famously very, very hard because um, it involves strong dynamics and we have no small parameter for extrapolation. On the other hand, for SUSY theories, following the monumental work of Cyberg in the 90s, there's a very controlled way of knowing exactly 
what the IR structure of the theory is, even though it's strongly coupled in many cases. And the reason is because uh, SUSY provides a really strong constraint on what the IR structure of the theory could be. So the left-hand side of this four blob diagram has been known since the 90s. And what we would like to stress here is that if you extrapolate from the left to the right with AMSV, um, you can do it in a very predictive way. And AMSV allows you to both extrapolate from the SUSY UV theory to a non-SUSY or near SUSY, depending on how large the SUSY breaking parameter is. Uh, you can do it in the UV theory, but AMSV also constrains exactly how the IR theory is deformed. So by knowing the left hand um, side of the diagram, you can also know what the right hand side of the diagram is. So let's focus on the problem. Uh, let's take a non susy uh, gauge theory. It could be SUN, SON, or SBN, or any kind of product of them with uh, fermions. Uh, and now, uh, because it's asymptotically free, there's higher uh, strong dynamics in the theory. And now we can ask ourselves, what is the higher structure or higher phase of the theory? Does the theory can confine? Is it in an abelian Coulomb phase, meaning there's an unhixed U1 symmetry that controls the IR degrees of freedom? Is it in an IR fixed point, like a bank Zach's fixed point in large NQCD? Uh, and this, we can also ask about the global symmetries. So the UV uh, theory has um, global symmetries, for example, a flavor symmetry working, acting on its fermions. And we can ask if the IR structure respects these symmetries or breaks them uh, spontaneously. So famously, if there are um, tooth anomalies for the symmetries in the UV, they have to be matched in the IR. And if the symmetries are not broken, they have to be saturated by some IR degrees of freedom. It could be a topological theory, or you need some uh, massless fermions in the theory to saturate the tooth anomalies. So these are the different things that can happen. And we want to be able to know in a controlled way what the theory does. And this is a very hard problem, obviously. When applied to QCD, uh, the questions are obvious. Can we prove from first principles the confinement of uh, quarks into hadrons, like a proton? And also, can we prove chiral symmetry breaking, which famously explains the likeness of uh, the pion as a pseudo goldstone of chiral symmetry breaking? Any questions so far? Okay. So what are the tools in our, our arsenal? There's of course Lattice, which is a huge subject that's making tremendous advancements, but I'm a very little, uh, very small expert on Lattice. So I'm not gonna say more about it, but hopefully in the future, Lattice would be um, the, the main diagnostic to tell us what happens in the IR of strongly coupled gauge theories. But until that happens, um, there are other things that we can, other more formal tools that we can use. So the first thing that comes to mind is anomaly matching, which I already mentioned in the context of uh, perturbative zero form anomalies. These are the traditional tip anomalies that we usually talk about. But um, lately in the past, uh, five to 10 years or so, there's been uh, tremendous uh, advancements on generalized anomaly matching, or also for higher form symmetries, uh, started by uh, work uh, of, by Cyberg et al. Uh, and I'm not gonna get too much into the consistency condition, other than that they will be automatically satisfied in everything that I'm gonna talk about, because we're extrapolating from a supersymmetric theory whose IR structure is fixed by symmetries and by holomorphy. And, uh, and so if the uh, consistency, consistency conditions are uh, respected by the SUSY theory, they'll be also be respected in our construction. So this is why I'm not gonna say much more about uh, generalized anomaly matching here. Famously, these are consistency conditions and uh, historically, there have been different suggestions of IR dynamics of one single theory, for example, chiral theories, which are all consistent with tooth anomaly matching. And then the question is, can you tell which one is actually realized by the theory? 
And of course, generalized anomaly matching puts more stringent constraints that could um, tell apart these different suggestions of the IR dynamics. But in what we will do, um, we won't have to guess and choose between different options. Our construction will be one-to-one, -one, just starting with the SUSY theory and extrapolating and seeing exactly what we get once we turn on the MSD. The third tool in our arsenal is a more heuristic tool called Tumbling, and uh, it was first thought of by uh, Demopoulos, Robbie, and Suskind in the 80s. Uh, heuristically, you talk about um, you, you, the language of tumbling is gauge uh, is not gauge invariant. You look at the most attractive cha channel attracting two particles, and you're saying that that's where you'll have a condensate which breaks its own gauge symmetry, and that will continue and break gauge symmetries until the theory becomes vector-like and then confines. But note that this, while it's an attractive idea. It's not a first principle thought. It's more of a, a heuristic uh, idea. And indeed, in our work, we found that sometimes there are contradictions between our, uh, our prediction uh, extrapolating from SUSY theories and what tumbling might tell you in the context of chiral gauge theory. And finally, let me get to the main point. We can do a controlled extrapolation from SUSY theories. And that's uh, been done by many, many authors in the past, uh, right after the uh, work on the, the monumental work on the SUSY side by Seiberg, people immediately asked the question, okay, what if we now break SUSY? Can we learn about a non-supersymmetric theory? And um, the problem was a problem of productivity as I will show you in a slide or two. If you just turn on soft masses for um, the squarks and the UV, you have no idea of knowing what it does to the uh, composites in the IR. There's like a disconnect between the UV and IR. So breaking SUSY in a non-controlled way um, is not predictive. There were later tries to do this in a more predictive manner. For example, the work by uh, Cheng and Shadmi, which relied on, on cyber duality to connect um, the UV and the IR. However, there you have to assume that the duality is still valid, even your, though you're perturbing away from the SUSY limit. So there, there was also um, an extrapolation problem when you go to large SUSY breaking. And finally, there's uh, been recent work by uh, Cordova and Dumitrescu uh, about starting from cyber Witten and then uh, introducing a SUSY breaking deformation that um, goes to adjoint QCD. And this is a much more predictive way of breaking supersymmetries. So we start with the SUSY theory and specifically an N equals one SUSY gauge theory. And SUSY provides a very strong constraint to the point that you can predict what the IR phase of the theory is. You can know what the degrees of freedom, namely the composites of the theory are uh, by global symmetries and also anomaly matching. So anomaly matching just gives you a very strong constraint to know what these degrees of freedom are. Moreover, you can fix the IR superpotential of the theory by a combination of holomorphy. Holomorphy means that only fields, only superfields can appear in the superpotential and not their complex conjugates by assigning global symmetries to the um, to the sorry to the composite degrees of freedom and also by examining the weak coupling limit, this famously allows us to completely fix the IR superpotential. For example, uh, for an SUN theory with NFs smaller than NC flavors, and the flavor I mean, uh, the bar is a little off on this Q, just pairs of uh, Q bar and Q in the fundamental of SUN. We can ask what is the dynamically generated superpotential uh, in the IR. And the combination of holomorphic global symmetries and the weak coupling limit uniquely fix it to be what's called the affleck dine cyber superpotential, which you can see here. And this is by assigning uh, the correct global symmetry properties to the Qs and also a transformation under uh, U1 axial to uh, this um, strong coupling factor. Lambda is a strong scale here 
and this is uh, it should always come with a three and C minus NF in an SUNC uh, theory. And famously, this means that the theory has a runaway. So um, the, if you look at the scalar potential, it just dies off with a power law towards, um, towards uh, large values of that Q, Q bar, which means that the theory has no uh, ground state. Um, any questions about that? Okay, I'll continue then. So the higher phase of the SUSY theory is known. And the question is why not just add soft SUSY breaking terms and extrapolate and see what we get. So like I mentioned before, there's a productivity problem. You know the SUSY side. So using holomorphy and the other tools, you know uh, what the higher strong dynamics does. There are composite superfields that are usually the mesons and uh, for large enough numbers of flavors there are also the baryons and a superpotential that's fixed by supersymmetry. Now I want to turn on soft masses. So I specifically add a term to my Lagrangian that's a mass term times the Gigino of the UV theory and a mass term uh, for the squarks of the UV theory. And now if I take these soft masses to be large, I'm guaranteed to get um, the same gauge group, but I decoupled all the unwanted super partners of the theory, and I'm left with the theory that I want to study, namely the gauge theory with only fermions. So the UV theory is not a problem. I just know exactly how to deform it to get my uh, desired non-supersymmetric theory. The problem here is the disconnect between the UV and the IR, because now there's some strong dynamics. And it's unclear what introducing the soft masses did to the IR theory. There's no way to just extrapolate from the composites on the SUSY side to um, the composites on the non-SUSY side. So that's a problem. It's a productivity problem. And using AMSV, we'll be able to bridge this gap. So now what we do is we take a lesson from the Kyler Lagrangian for, for QCD. This is going to be just a one slide reminder uh, how we draw inspiration uh, from the Kyler Lagrangian when we come to break Suzy in a controlled way. Now, the massless, just reminded you, the massless QCD Lagrangian has an explicit chiral symmetry, SU3 left cross SU3 right. And famously, we know experimentally that um, in the IR, the strong dynamics breaks chiral symmetry into uh, the vector combination. And the pseudo gosons of this breaking are the pions. In addition, if we have bare quark masses, which are generated by the Higgs mechanism, they also explicitly break uh, SU3L cross SU3R to the vector combination in the UV theory. So now we want to know, we know how the quark masses enter in the UV Lagrangian, and we exactly want to know how they enter in the IR Lagrangian, which is the chiral Lagrangian for the pions. In other words, we want to know how the pion mass depends on the bare masses of the quarks. So the famous way to do this is to um, imagine that these masses are not parameters for a second. They're actually particles that transform as compensators or spurions for this SU3L cross SU3R uh, symmetry. Now, if we imagine that their uh, fields transform, transforming this way, then the UV theory is again symmetric under the full SU3L cross SU3R. And if the IR theory is not symmetric under this SU3 cross SU3R, it could only be because of spontaneous uh, symmetry breaking which uh, we parameterize by a field U, which is just the exponentiation of the pions. And now famously, U can only be the, the sole source of uh, chiral symmetry breaking formally in the IR Lagrangian, which means that when we come to write the IR Lagrangian, the masses have to couple to U in a, in a way that, which exactly respects the full SU3L cross SU3R symmetry. And in other words, this is uh, called the CCWZ uh, formalism. So the way the masses enter the IR is fixed by symmetry. 
and this is desirable, we want to use a similar thing when we break SUSE. So the lesson that we learned for our case is that to keep track of the SUSE breaking in our IRBFT, it needs to be a spurion for some global symmetry breaking. There should be some symmetry that will force where the SUSE breaking enters in the IR Lagrangian. And let me show you how we do that. So this is the classic slide about anomaly mediated SUSE breaking, which was famously thought of by these people right here. The idea for AMSB is that SUSE breaking is mediated from some SUSE breaking sector only by supergravity, which means that between our gauge theory and some unknown SUSE breaking sector, there's no direct interaction, not even through Planck suppressed operators. And that's called sequestering and can be realized in an extra dimensional picture where the two sectors are just on different grains and only supergravity is allowed to travel through the bulk and communicate between the two sectors. So what happens? Uh, the SUSE breaking sector dynamically breaks SUSE for some unknown reason. We know many ways to break SUSE dynamically. And that gets communicated to the supergravity sector by what's called the super Higgs mechanism. Um, similarly to um, the breaking of a global symmetry that produces a goldstone. And then if you gauge the symmetry, the W boson eats the goldstone boson and becomes massive. In a SUSE setting, if you gauge supersymmetry to get supergravity, uh, now breaking SUSE, uh, um, in breaking SUSE, the uh, gravitino eats the goldstone and becomes massive. And this is what you get in the supergravity sector. So you have a massive gravitino and the super Higgs mechanism. And that because uh, supergravity couples both to the SUSE breaking sector and to our gauge theory, which was originally supersymmetric. The SUSE breaking gets communicated by uh, W, which is the measure of the SUSE breaking over n Planck squared. So there's the, what we should learn here is that the SUSE breaking is only communicating via uh, supergravity. There's only one single parameter that controls the SUSE breaking and that's M. And in the next slide, we'll see that the way this M enters is exactly constrained by global symmetry, which in this case is uh, the symmetry under super wild rotations. That's the version of the chiral symmetry uh, that we saw in the previous slide for the chiral Lagrangian. So this is not a talk about supergravity, uh, nor would I know how to give such a talk at this point in my career. Uh, but what I do know uh, in a very sketchy way is that the way to couple a supersymmetric theory to supergravity is to first introduce a compensator that will make the theory super conformal and inv variant. And once you do that, you can couple the theory to what's called the super uh, conform, the conformal way, uh, sorry, the conformal version of supergravity. And now if you give this, um, this compensator field above, you will regain what's called Poincaré supergravity. These uh, very highbrow words uh, just mean that um, there's a field, epsilon. This epsilon is the one which, uh, gets the SUSE breaking term from supergravity. And it comes as an F term, meaning it's the coefficient of the theta squared where theta is, is the superspace parameter. And this epsilon couples in a way which is exactly constrained by the symmetry under super wild transformations. The same way that the quark masses entered the IR Lagrangian in a way that was um, constrained by conformal symmetry in the previous example. And the way this field epsilon enters is that eps and enters with an epsilon star epsilon in front of the Kähler potential, and it enters with an epsilon cube term in front of the super potential. And we also rescale all the fields by this epsilon. So let me repeat uh, what, what I said just now. In order to couple to a supergravity sector, you introduce this field epsilon. 
the epsilon couples in a way which is exactly uh, constrained by super wild transformations, it compensates for the fact that the Suzy theory is not symmetric under super wild transformations. Then you can couple it to supergravity. And if supergravity also talks to a Suzy breaking sector that triggers the existence of this F term for the compensator, and this is how the Suzy breaking enters. And what's important to learn from this is that this form, equation one, is valid to both the UV and the IR theory, which makes it predictive. Because now the arrow that goes from the SUSY theory to the non suzy theory exists both for the UV and for the IR. Okay, let me stress this point a little bit more. The SUSY theory, uh, Whenever it breaks conformal invariance, it means that you need to couple it to the compensator field in order to couple it to uh, supergravity, which means that if we turn on the SUSY breaking in the SUSY breaking sector, that will induce uh, as the F term for the compensator field, and that will uh, generate SUSY breaking. Let me first give a non-example, an example in which there's just no SUSY breaking because there's no coupling to the compensator. If I started with a theory which has a marginal term in the superpotential, there's no dimensional full parameter here. I can couple it to conformal supergravity right away. I don't need a compensator. And if I manually try to introduce a compensator, I have this epsilon cubed here, but I also rescale all the fields. The dependence on the compensator drops out, which means that I get my original W again. And because the Susie breaking parameter well, was encapsulated in the F term, in the M theta squared term inside this epsilon, I don't couple to uh, Suzy breaking at all. In other words, if uh, my Suzy theory is at a super conformal fixed point, it'll never couple to my, uh, to my compensator and it will never feel the Suzy breaking. So even if I manually try to couple it to AMSB, I will stay super conformal. And, Conformality, both conformality and SUSY will uh, stay in the presence of AMSB. So after this non-example, let me give you an actual example. What happens when I have a tree-level dimensional full parameter in my superpotential? And this is this mu. Now, if I go through this general formula here, equation number one, and specifically I do it for the superpotential, I find that the rescaling of the field did not cancel out the epsilon cube terms. And then when I look at the scalar potential, I see that this mu, which is the supersymmetric parameter, uh, gets multiplied by m, which is now my Suzy breaking term. So this is the supersymmetric part of the potential. And this is the tree level A minus B part of the superpotential. And if you just analyze the behavior of this uh, potential, you see that it has a runaway direction which will eventually be balanced by the fact that um, there are higher order directions to the Kähler potential. Any questions so far? Okay, let me move on. So the lesson is, if I have a marginal superpotential, I'll never get Suzy breaking from AMSB. If I have a dimension full parameter at tree level, I will get tree level AMSB. However, even if I don't have a dimensional full parameter in my superpotential, uh, conformal symmetry famously uh, could also be uh, broken uh, by RG ran running, meaning that conformal symmetry is anomalous. Uh, so whenever I have RGE in my theory, like a beta function for the gauge coupling or running of the Yukawa coupling, that will generate A minus B by the fact that the conformal compensator now couples to the scale of the RG. Whenever I have a scale, I also have A minus B. If the scale is generated at loop level, then A minus B will also be generated at loop level. And these are the contributions to the soft masses of the Pginos and the sporks, and also the A terms from this uh, loop level breaking of uh, super conformal symmetry. And that is the reason that we call it uh, A minus B. The word anomaly here refers to the superconformal anomaly, which uh, comes about as the RGE running of the theory. Good. 
Good. So here's the bottom line. If we break Susie by A minus V, because of the constraint, uh, the coupling to the Susie breaking is constrained by basically um, symmetry under super wild transformations, there's a way to extrapolate from the UV theory to the IR theory. Sorry, from the supersymmetric UV theory to the non supersymmetric UV theory, but also from the uh, supersymmetric theory of the composites in the IR to a non supersymmetric uh, theory of the composites in the IR. And it, the way that it works is you exactly uh, put the conformal compensator here, which includes the Suzy breaking. Good. So this was uh, already covered in Hitoshi's talk, but I was uh, happy to repeat that for you. So let's see an application of this, uh, which I, I find pretty exciting in the context of SON gauge theory. So why SON? The, the first thing that comes to mind is true confinement in the sense that uh, probe particles uh, very, very far apart in the case that the theory is the SO theory is confining, will actually feel a linear potential. On the other hand, in an SU theory with, with dynamical fundamental matter, you can always pop a quark and an antiquark out of the vacuum to cut off your flux tubes, which means that macroscopically um, there's uh, screening of uh, flux tubes. There's breaking and screening of flux tubes, and we'll, we'll never see a true linear potential at macroscopic distances. And when I say SON, the expert in the audience might ask, what exactly do you mean? So well, when I say SON, it's a colloquial name for theories in which the, the algebra is small letters S, O, and C, and with matter, dynamical matter in the vector representation. And famously, there, there are different choices of the global structure of the gauge group. Um, you can choose exactly what gauge group you mean that has the Lie algebra SON. So it could be the gauge group spin NC, or it could be the gauge group SONC. And there are also other choices by modding spin NC by different discrete symmetries. And also um, you can choose what's called discrete theta angles that fix exactly your global structure. And if, uh, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, there will be a part of the talk that I will talk more about this. If I choose the global structure to be um, the universal cover, spin and C, it means that I have an order parameter at my disposal to diagnose confinement. So of course, if confinement is a phase and to identify a phase, we want an order parameter. And the order parameter for confinement is not a local uh, order parameter, is rather the law for the transformation of a non-trivial Wilson loop. If the Wilson, the value of the Wilson loop uh, grows like its perimeter, it means that there's screening in the theory. Well, if it grows like an area law, it means that there's confinement in the theory. So SON, differently from SUN, allows me to have a non-trivial Wilson loop that I can use as my diagnostic and say, if I can prove that it has an area law, then I indeed uh, am proving true confinement in the theory. The other reason to focus on SO is that uh, in the SUSY theory, you can actually see light molecules and ions. And there's this notion called dual Meissner effect, which is when uh, molecules or ions condense, that actually leads to the confinement of uh, quarks. And this is a famous picture due to Mandelstam and Tuft. So for SONC with uh, NF equals NC minus two flavors. The theory is in an abelian Coulomb phase. And we'll delve more into the math of that later. The point is that on the moduli space of the theory, which I'll define what a moduli space means uh, very soon, there are two singular points. And singular points are associated with the existence of new massless degrees of freedom. In this case, uh, Entrelegator and Seiberg showed that the new massless degrees of freedom are just the conventional tuft polycove molecules or uh, dions, which become massless at these uh, singular points. So usually we think of tuft polycove molecules as these very massive 
objects in gauge theory, but that's actually that actually comes from a weak coupling uh, intuition. And in these points, the theory is strongly coupled, and one of its effects is that it lowers the mass of the total product of monopoles of the theory until they actually become massless at these singular points. When we introduce anomaly mediation, we expect the monopoles to condense and explicitly realize this notion of a dual Meissner effect. Uh, and this was seen before in cyborg witten theory when you uh, deform it to n equals one supersymmetry, but that was in a supersymmetric setting. And we will show that actually arises in a non susy setting. So two reasons to do SON. One, good diagnostic for confinement. Two, you actually have monopoles that can lead to confinement through the dual Meissner effect. And we will see it explicitly. Any questions before I get into a recap of the supersymmetric version of SL? All right. Can you hear me well, by the way? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. I'm just checking. All right. So let's do a lightning review of not all of the supersymmetric theory, but oh, maybe maybe a naive question. Just yeah. make sure whether the uh, the SU and SU special unitary group case was already uh, fully discussed in Hitoshi's talk or is not? Oh yeah. SU. So the, the SUN was fully analyzed by Hitoshi, but of course um, there's no phase boundary. There's complementarity between the confining and Higgs phase there. Uh, so you're not going to have a good uh, Wilson line to diagnose confinement in that setting. Um, so of course it's um, uh, it's important. Yeah, in its of own course, way. if you take um, oh, sorry, oh. I hear okay. it. Of course, if you take S U and C with two index fermions, um, mm -hmm. if n is even, there is again confinement. It's very similar to S O case. Right, and that'll be an interesting follow-up work. I agree. Uh, it's a also, even with fundamental, if you go to large end limits, uh, you know, string breaking is suppressed by one over n. And again, there's a precise meaning to confinement. I agree. So these, these two things will be very interesting to analyze with AMSB, and it's definitely on our uh, list for the next things to okay. look at. Yeah. Great. All right. So let's look at the SUSY theory and look at the work of by Trilligator and Cyberg from 95. So we look at n equals one SUSY. Oh, maybe, an maybe another question. This might be also naive. Sometimes the spatial unitary group will be, uh, will be the same as the sound covering of the spatial unit, uh, spatial also gonna group. For example, the spin three is SU2, it's double cover SO3 and, and also mm -hmm. the spin six which is uh, the, the covering of SO6. It's also, spin six is the same as SU4. So I wonder whether for those group will, 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 will any approach be enough or whether there is some complementary of a different way of looking at the problems? It's also yeah. a naive question. Yeah. No, it's, a, it's a actually a very good question. And, and mostly what we will talk about here is when um, NC is large enough so you don't have these relations. But of course, uh, for SO3, the situation is different and it is related to SU. And these are kind of the subtler points of the Intrilligator cyber paper in the SUSY context. And as a matter of fact, we are currently looking at these things in the follow-up paper by starting with, uh, with cyber witten So we're starting with N equals two and if you think both the deformation to N equals one, as well as aim the speed to study um, in more detail the IR structure of these spheres. So whenever you see NC here, just imagine that it's uh, large enough to not have these subtleties. So what will be a typical NC and F, and F you actually analyze? Just give me a sense. What are the NC? Oh, NC larger than five. And then okay. NF is, uh, our conclusions will be valid for um, all nf smaller than three halves nc minus two. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. No problem. Good. So the global symmetry of this theory is su and f uh, flavor symmetry acting on the q's, the vectors, 
uh, and there's a, a U1 R symmetry. There's also a discrete symmetry, Z2 and F, acting on the Qs. But uh, um, a ZNF part of this group, it will actually be contained in the SUNF uh, flavor. So this is why we have to modify it. And we also have Z2, which is uh, charge conjugation. And here in the table, you see the assignments uh, for, for the quarks and the phigenos, uh, as well as the mesons um, under the, the gauge and global symmetries. And the mesons are, uh, will be the higher degrees of freedom. The modular space is famously parameterized by these mesons, which we can think about as uh, uh, bilinears or confined states of the two Qs. And for a large enough number of flavors, we're also have baryons in our theory. And uh, the mesons and the baryons in some cases are good coordinates on the moduli space of the theory. The moduli space is the space of um, beds that we can give to the scalar components uh, in the theory. Uh, and for NF smaller than NC, we'll have um, exactly NF parameters, phi squares, which uh, you can arrange in, on the diagonal of the meson theory up to flavor uh, transformations. And, uh, and they will be good coordinates on the moduli space. And for NF larger than NC, these will be uh, the operators. Again, it, you know, the moduli space coordinates will be phi one squared to phi and C squared, and the baryon will be related to these phi's by this relation. So here's a famous plot from the supersymmetric analysis by Trilligator and Cyber. The phases of, in the IR of the theory uh, very much depend on the relation between the number of flavors, the number of vectors I have in the theory, and the number of colors. So for number of flavors smaller or equal than NC minus five, I will have a dy dynamically generated affordine cyber superpotential with a runaway and no supersymmetric or, or otherwise ground state. For NC minus three and minus four, there are actually two branches and uh, I'm not gonna get into that, but if you're interested, I have um, um, descriptions in the background in the, um, backup slides, what to do with them with A and C. Uh, on one of the branches uh, for NC minus four, there's no dynamically generated superpotential. And on the other branch, I have, again, the Afrodyne cyber superpotential. And for NC minus three on one of the branches, I uh, have some superpotential generated around the origin, while on the other branch, I again have the Afrodyne cyber superpotential. But we won't worry too much about these subtleties. The phase that will be very important for us is the abelian coulomb phase, because this is the one in which you can see monopoles. And then by introducing the MSB, you can see them condense and generate confinement. So we will spend some time thinking about the abelian coulomb phase here. And for larger number of flavors, we are in the conformal window. So at the bottom part, we are in the free, free magnetic phase. And we will be able to show by a one line argument that. Um, our study of the lower number of flavors also implies confinement for the, um, the free magnetic phase plus A and B. And for the free electric part of the conformal window, I won't say much because we are still um, checking if we can be predictive in that regime. So let's drill down into these two phases. For a small number of flavors, uh, for a generic uh, VEB for the scalar component of the mesons, the SONC theory is Higgs to SO and C minus and F super Yanimos with no massless flavors. And famously in super Yanimos, what we have is Gagina condensation, which uh, generates an Affleckdine cyber uh, super potential that you can see here. And the form of this super potential is dictated by, um, by holomorphy and by global symmetries in the weak coupling limit. And as I said, the SUSY theory has no ground state. And soon we will introduce AMSB and see what it does. It basically balances the runaway on a non-SUSY vacuum. For NF equals NC minus two, we have this special abelian Coulomb phase. So for a generic M, SONC is actually Higgs to a U1 uh, symmetry. Sorry, I wrote SYM, but it's actually just a 
U, U1, uh, a pure U1 uh, theory. Uh, and in the, in the school phase, we can study the modulate space in detail. And we can know more details than uh, in other cases of the n equals one gauge symmetry. Specifically, we can uh, solve a monotony problem and know exactly what the value of the effective gauge coupling, which we have here as uh, theta over pi, where theta is the theta angle, plus two pi i over g squared, uh, and where g is the gauge coupling of the effective u1 gauge coupling of the theory. And this is a completely solve theory, very similar to uh, the case of n equals two uh, that Seiberg and Witten studies studied in the 90s. Similarly to the seiberg witten story, whenever I have a singularity in tau, that implies the existence of massless composite particles at that point in moduli space. And if I look at the monogamy around tau, that actually tells me more information about what these massless composites are specifically what their electric and magnetic charges are under this uh, U1 that survives on the Coulomb branch. And I can actually tell that at one point I get dions and in another point I get massless monopoles. So without um, getting into the derivation, if you open the paper by Intrigator and Cyberg, they write down um, the cyberg witten curve that basically encapsulates all, all the information about the effective U1 coupling on the moduli space. And um, you can solve uh, the monodromy problem implied by uh, the cyber witten curve, namely um, the gauge coupling is singular where two roots of the curve coincide. And here I gave uh, kind of a complex plain plot of uh, Y as a function of X and the yellow, blue, and green here are uh, the roots of the curve. And as I change that M, which is my coordinate on the moduli space, uh, these singularities will approach each other. And exactly at two places, two roots of the curve will coincide. And these are the places where tau is singular. These two places are when the depth M is zero, and like we said, singularities in tau imply the existence of massless states. In this case, the massless states are dions and they come in a flavor multiplet, an SUNF anti-fundamental multiplet. And they have uh, charges plus minus magnetic charges plus minus one and also an electric charge. On the other hand, on the other singularity, the other value where the two roots of the cyber witten curve coincide uh, I have a different kind of uh, massless composite degree of freedom. And by looking at the monotony around this singularity, I can know exactly what their charges are. And their charges are plus minus one uh, for their magnetic charges and zero for the electric charges. So these are massless monopoles. So just to conclude, without getting too much into the details, I can go in the moduli space parameterized by the determinant of the meson matrix. These are the scalar components of the composite mesons of the theory. And as I go around the moduli space, at the origin and, and at points where that M is equal to this U1, I suddenly have a singularity in tau. And that singularity implies the existence of massless degrees of freedom. And by the monotony around the singularity, I can know exactly what these are. And famously, these are dions at one point and monopoles at the other. So now we can write an effective theory constrained by holomorphy and symmetry around the dion point and around the monopole point. So near the dion point, so close to the point on the moduli space where that m is zero, I have an effective superpotential, which couples the mesons to um, the dions. And I can write this coupling because the meson uh, is uh, in the symmetric of the flavor symmetry, while the, uh, um, the Qs are in the anti-fundamentals of the SUNF symmetry. And you need this super potential, it has to be there because away from this dion point, away from that M equals zero, the dions have to be massive and integrated out. So you have to have the super potential. Exactly at that M equals zero, 
um, the superpotential vanishes and these diamonds become exactly massless. And a good consistency condition by Interligator and Cyber is that um, is that the uh, anomalies are masked. Okay, good. On the modular uh, space, um, sorry, this slide is a little problematic. It got, oops. Ignore these two points because they uh, flew over from, oh, okay, good. Sorry, everything is fine. This is the dying singularity. Now let's take, take a look at the monopole singularity. Again, we have a super potential that gives the monopoles a mass away from the monopole point. And because we are now at that M not equal zero, the global symmetry is broken to SO cross U1R by the Bevelkin meson. And exactly at uh, the massless monopole point, the Tuft anomalies are matched by the meson, the massless monopoles, and the Putino of the, the uh, putting of the unbroken magnetic U1. So notice that these things are not random. If we then have a good counting of the degrees of freedom, including the emergence of massless monopoles, we would never be able to match the Tuft anomalies for the unbroken symmetries. So this is a huge consistency constraint, which tells us that we really know, we're not just guessing that there are massless diamonds and monopoles there. Good. So with this recap, let's go into what we did, which is literally take all this and put in anomaly mediation. Let's look at the Dian singularity. So close to the Dian singularity, we had this uh, super potential, which gives the Dian's a mass away from the origin. And uh, around the origin itself, I have no dimensionable parameter. So if you remember what I said in the beginning of the talk, um, if my superpotential is marginal and I don't have a tree level dimensional parameter, anus view will only enter at loop level. So we can um, do an exercise of calculating the RGE for the U1 gauge coupling and this effective U power coupling in the Dian superpotential. And what we see is that the RGE flows to um, a place where the ratio between the U power and the gauge coupling is constant. And the Yukawa actually gives a positive contribution to the soft masses. If you take this and you add the tree level superpotential that you get from this Dion uh, uh, superpotential, you find a scalar potential given by this formula. And then it's just a minimization problem. And we find that the, um, the local minimum in the theory is of order uh, the Susie breaking mass M. It's a Susie breaking minimum because we have loop level A and B. And its height is M over 16 pi squared, reflecting the fact that whatever triggered the Susie breaking was a loop level effect. And in addition, because of the uh, tree level part of uh, the super potential, the uh, Dion vectors um, take directions which are orthogonal to each other breaking the global symmetry from SUNF to SUNF minus two. So without getting lost in the weeds too much, uh, I wanna summarize what we got here. We have a minimum, which is SUSY breaking. It has Dian condensation because these cues which reflect the Dian's got uh, non-trivial depths. So this is, is actually a minimum which induces confinement. However, we have kind of a weird global symmetry breaking pattern that should make us a little uncomfortable. We expect the global symmetry to be, to be broken to SONF and not to this weird SUNF minus two. But also this is not necessarily the global minimum of the theory because there's another point, there's the monopole point. And if the minimum that we get from A minus B around the monopole point is lower, then what we have here is just not the global minimum of the theory and it tells us nothing about the supersymmetric, about the non-supersymmetric theory. And this is indeed what happens. Let's focus on the monopole singularity. Here around the monopole singularity, which is at M equals to uh, U1, M, the, the BEV of the mesons is approximately lambda. Here I have a dimensional full parameter in the uh, superpotential. And according to the heuristic that I showed you earlier on, Whenever I have a tree level 
uh, the measurable parameter and the superpotential, that induces tree level anus speed. And when I look at the way that anus speed couples, it's constrained by symmetry. So it tells me exactly what that anus speed uh, potential is. And it indeed goes like lambda times the anus speed parameter. Now, when I add this to the supersymmetric part of the potential, I find uh, a global minimum of the theory. It's almost by definition lower than the local minimum that we found earlier because it's supported by a tree level contribution rather than a loop level contribution. And in this minimum, what I find is as follows. There's a non-trivial VEV for the mesons, which breaks global symmetry. There's a non-trivial VEV for the monopoles, which leads to confinement because of the dual Meissner effect that tells us that um, the condensation of monopoles equals confinement. And it's a global minimum of the theory, which is uh, created in, at tree level and is lower than the other local minimum. So what did we achieve? We took whatever Cyberg and, and uh, Interligator analyzed in the 90s, we introduced anus speed, and we find the SUSY breaking global minimum at the monopole singularity. And there we find monopole condensation, which implies confinement. And we also find global symmetry breaking uh, to SO. And because the global symmetry is now at SO, there are no uh, Tooft anomalies to saturate. So this is a hands-on proof of confinement and global symmetry breaking in a non SUSY theory. And of course, uh, a question that I am anticipating is, well, you keep saying non SUSY, but it's actually a near SUSY limit because in the, the back of your uh, head, you, of your mind, you're thinking of um, the SUSY breaking as a little perturbation. And of course, there's a question that I will address later. What happens when you start cranking up the SUSY breaking, especially when it goes over uh, the size of the strong coupling scale lambda? Can you really extrapolate to the completely non-SUSY limit? And that, of course, remains to be seen. One more cool thing that I want to say is that um, here, the uh, global symmetry breaking arose in kind of a mysterious way. It was uh, basically to, due to a web of the scalar component of um, the mesons. But if we want to extrapolate to the completely non SUSY limit, mesons um, um, now um, their scalar component should reflect some kind of uh, confined fermions. And famously, uh, the picture by Nambu and John LSMU is that uh, in QCD, chiral symmetry breaking is triggered by a web or a fermion by linears. That's why chiral symmetry is broken. So how do we bridge the source of global symmetry breaking that we saw in the SUSY case with Amos B with uh, the um, uh, picture that we get in the non SUSY limit from fermion by linears. And it's very cool to see that it works because in the IR, what we see is that the uh, mesons get an F term because there's SUSY breaking. And this F term is actually proportional to the VEV of the monopoles, which was responsible for confinement, and it's non zero. And now we want to read off what this F term actually means in the not deep non supersymmetric limit. Because the UV superpotential vanishes, it means that the F terms for the constituents of the mesons, the quarks, all vanish, which means that there's only one interpretation of this F term. This F term is actually the condensate of the fermionic of uh, the fermion bilinears. This is the fermion component of the quark superfield, and this is the fermionic component of the other quark, and this bilinear is equal to the F term, which is not zero by our analysis. So our supersymmetric reason for breaking global symmetry actually goes over to the neville john Alessinio picture in the deep uh, non-supersymmetric limit. Any questions about this point? All right, good. So I showed you something that I think is kind of cool that we can explicitly see monopole condensation and chiral symmetry breaking in a non susy setting. But I showed it in a very narrow case, right? The number of 
uh, flavors with exactly the number of colors minus two in order for us to explicitly see the uh, monopoles and to make them condense. The question is what happens with lower and higher numbers of flavors? Can we still see confinement? Can we still say that the reason for confinement is monopole condensation if we can't see the monopoles explicitly because there's no Coulomb phase? And the answer is that you actually can simply by starting with the case that we already know, the NF equals NC minus two, and just integrating out flavors by giving them supersymmetric masses. So in other words, monopole condensation is secretly responsible for confinement in all the lower numbers of flavors as well. Let's start with global symmetry breaking. So let's uh, just have S, O, and C with a small number of flavors. Uh, the SUSY analysis tells us that there's no ground state and there's a dynamically generated affleck time superpotential generated uh, by Eugenio condensation. Uh, there's a little bit of a subtlety here that the canonically normalized field is not the meson, but actually um, the, the quark itself. And we will ignore the two branch subtlety for NF equals NC minus three or NC minus four because the global minimum will always be on this branch with the ADS superpotential. Another question is what happens when I turn on AMSB? So what happens is just reflected in the plot I'm showing here. This is the scalar potential. And if, um, if I don't turn on AMSB, there's just a runaway and there's no ground state for the theory. As soon as I turn on AMSB, there's a minimum it's a global minimum, and this global minimum is below zero, which means that SUSY is indeed broken. So these are SUSY breaking minima. And I know exactly by, uh, by symmetry what the AMSB contribution will be. I can minimize the super potential, and I can find this global minimum. And this global minimum is a, a, a finite web for, for the quarks, for phi. So I get SUSY breaking from the fact that this minimum is uh, lower than zero. It's a global minimum because it's a tree level AMSB contribution from a dimension full parameter and the super potential. It's global symmetry breaking because it's a non-zero VEV for the phi, which means that I'm breaking the global symmetry from SUNF to SONF. But like I said, I don't see any monopole condensation. There's no Coulomb phase. There are no monopoles becoming massless. How can I show this? So what we do, like I said before, is we just start with the um, case that we're familiar with, the NF equals NC minus two, and we turn on supersymmetric masses to integrate out flavors. And what we wanna see is that we um, reduce to the case with lower numbers of flavors while retaining the VEV of the monopoles that indicates confinement. So this is, um, the super potential at the monopole point of the uh, NF equals NC minus two case, we turn on supersymmetric mass terms. Here we integrate out the last flavor. There's a little bit of a subtlety about uh, the Kähler potential, but I won't get into this right now. You can ask me later if you're interested. And here's what we get. Uh, so let me explain a little bit about this plot. This is um, following the global minimum of the SUSY breaking global minimum of the theory. When I turn on AMSB, uh, I start from the case where uh, the number of flavors is uh, NC minus two, which is the one with monopole condensation that I analyzed before. And then I uh, slowly crank up the supersymmetric mass for the last flavor. And what I wanna do here is I wanna see that the minimum goes over from the NF equals NC minus two case to the NC minus uh, three case while retaining the VEV E of the monopoles. And this is indeed what happens. And the different curves just, tell, just uh, give different values for um, the AMSB breaking parameter over the strong coupling scale. So here I start with a non-zero VEV for the monopoles. I, turn on uh, the supersymmetric mass term, I go over to uh, 
be familiar with VEB from um, the lower numbers of flavors. And what's important here is that E didn't go to zero. So monopole condensation persists. So the conclusion from here is that even in the lower uh, number of flavors, you have secretly monopole condensation from the case with the higher number of flavors. We can do the same exercise by giving a mass to all of the flavors together and going to the pure yang mills case. So even in the young yang mills case, there's secretly monopole uh, condensation, which you can see by starting with the NC minus two case and then just integrating all NC minus two flavors uh, away while retaining the monopole uh, both. So this is a way to just demonstrate confinement in pure, pure young mills in the near Suzy limit, I would say. Any questions about this? All right, so I showed you that there's monopole condensation and chiral symmetry breaking for NF equals NC minus two, where you can explicitly see the monopoles. I showed you that you can integrate uh, flavors all the way to pure Yang mills while retaining confinement and chiral symmetry breaking. So that covers the entire margin from NF equals NC minus two and down to zero. And now let's ask about the free magnetic phase, which uh, let me show you where it was. Right here, okay. So from here down, covered. Now let's talk about the free magnetic case. And as I promised, there's just a one slide uh, demonstration that uh, our effect remains in here. And it passes through the magnetic dual. So famously uh, in this uh, conformal window, the IR physics is well described by a theory with a different gauge rule which uh, is uh, SO of NF minus NC plus four with uh, matter content as follows. There are the Qs which are now, which now denote dual quarks and there are mesons which are singlets under the SO NF minus, T, minus NC plus four gauge symmetry and a super potential for the magnetic dual which is as follows. But now what happens is that a generic, at a generic point on the moduli space the M gets a VEB and you can, and that means that the Qs get a mass and you can integrate them out. So you're basically left in uh, low energy with the pure super Yang Mills theory. But we already demonstrated in the electric theory that pure Yang Mills uh, confines and breaks global symmetry due to our integrating out um, argument. And now we apply this argument, but just in the magnetic dual. So, QED, we proved it for pure Yang Mills. The magnetic dual in the IR free uh, um, uh, phase um, is pure Yang Mills. So that proves it. Okay. Any questions? All right, so now for uh, the almost final part of the talk. We showed you the local behavior, what condenses, what symmetries get broken. And now let's uh, translate this to this order parameter for confinement, which is the Wilson line. And for that, we'll need a little bit uh, more um, sophisticated view of the global structure of the gauge group. Um, so we showed monopole condensation and now our order parameter is the, the Wilson line, which is just the, uh, the integral, the path order integral of uh, a particle in some representation under the electric or magnetic gauge group going in a closed loop. And I told you that these, these Wilson lines are good order parameters for confinement. Uh, and the, the heuristic is that if you have monopoles condensed, that leads to an area law for the Wilson loop and that leads to confinement. But this is a tiny bit too heuristic. So let's get a little more into the math. What you really have in, in the theory is um, you make a, a choice of what the global structure of the gauge group is. And that tells you what the allowed 
uh, line operators in the theory is. And famously, these line operators are labeled by charges, Zm and Zn, which are charges under the center symmetry, which is the discrete symmetry you get by taking the universal cover of the gauge group and modding out by the gauge group. These Zs are equivalence classes of all lines with uh, irreducible representations that correspond to Z plus a root of the magnetic lattice and ZE plus the root of the electric lattice. Uh, and just to make it a little more concrete, the Zs equals zero comma zero mean is an equivalence class of all Wilson lines in which I take uh, a particle in the vector representation, in this case of spin, uh, spin or, or SL, and I take it around the loop. And it can be in a vector representation of the electric uh, version of the gauge group or the magnetic version of the gauge group, or even a dionic version of the gauge group. However, uh, in contrast, when uh, I have Zm comma Ze equals zero one, it means that I, in addition uh, uh, to the vector Wilson lines, I also have a spinner Wilson line. This is a good uh, order parameter for confinement because it cannot be screened by vectors. Basically, if you have two particles in the spinner of, uh, of spin and C, I can't, even if I pop out a vector particle, a dynamical particle in the vector representation of this O from the vacuum, it's not gonna be able to cut the flux tubes between the two spinners and screen the theory. So this is why the spinner Rosa line is a good order parameter for uh, the confinement of electric degrees of freedom. And similarly, I have the same thing for a tough line, which has, uh, magnetic uh, particles in the spinner under the magnetic uh, version of the gauge group. All true line operators are constrained by uh, Dirac quantization. And that means that I can't have everything. I gotta make a choice and that choice tells me what are the valid non-trivial uh, line operators in my theory. And in our case, because we're interested in diagnosing the confinement of color degrees of freedom, will make uh, the choice of spin n, which means rather than SO, which means that the non-trivial line operator at our disposal is the spinner Wilson line, which has the label zero comma one here. This is our choice and it's motivated by the fact that we need something to tell us if it gets an area law, there's confinement. If it gets a perimeter law, then there's no confinement. All other lines are just trivially screened because they can pop out a, a vector, a particle in the vector representation from the vacuum and cut the flux tubes. So they're not good order parameters for confinement. The rule of thumb is when a particle with particular charges, electric and magnetic charges condenses, all the lines with, uh, with labels that are aligned with the electric and magnetic charges of whatever condenses have a perimeter law. They're basically screened by the existence of the condensate. And all other non-trivial lines have an area law, which means that they indicate confinement of these degrees of freedom. In our case, we showed that the particles that condense are specifically monopoles. And that's very important because the spinner Wilson line has the label zero comma one. It's not aligned with the monopoles so it's telling us that it actually confines. And this is the link between whatever condenses, monopole, dion, ele electrically charged particle, and the behavior of the order parameter for confinement, area or perimeter. Alternatively, we could have chosen uh, two different global structures for, um, for the group. And there are also other choices with other non-trivial lines, a tough line here or a dionic line, and their behavior is different. The tough line is actually screened because it's aligned with the monopoles which condense, while the spinner dionic line is not aligned, so it confines. Good. So before finishing, uh, let us uh, go to the outlook. And beyond this particular example that we showed, as as much as I think it's uh, it's uh, interesting to see confinement and chiral symmetry breaking in a non susy setting, there's, there are also thoughts for the future. So one question that I was asking myself is, 
what are the examples, not just what we studied, studied in which you have a good order of parameter for confinement, namely uh, a non-trivial line that cannot be screened by dynamical matter, uh, and specifically a non-trivial Wilson line because we're interested in electric confinement. So these cases are um, spin, which we just showed, pure Yang-Mills, uh, and also uh, SUN with two adjoint matter fields. And these things were studied. Uh, so spin is studied in this work. Pure uh, SUN is basically taking Cyberg Witten and uh, breaking by soft masses, which is what Konishi and Evans et al. did in 95. So you start with Cyberg Witten, you deform it to n equals one, and you also introduce soft breaking, and you are able to uh, establish monopole condensation. Uh, and in, in adjunct SUNC, there's a, a rather recent paper by Cordova and Dumitrescu who showed um, that there's a possibility of a phase with monopole condensation, even though they're careful uh, whether or not this is actually the global minimum of the theory. So is this a coincidence that in these three examples in which there's a good order parameter for confinement, there's also a way to explicitly see monopole condensation. It looks a little too good to be true. It looks like the dual Meissner effect could actually be somehow proven to be the key mechanism responsible for confinement. Whenever we can ask the question if the theory confines or not, we are actually given the tool to diagnose whether it confines or not by monopole condensation. And let me just comment that this is an intuition that's relevant for small numbers of flavors because for a large number of flavors, we imagine that there's some form of bank Zax fix, fixed point and there's no confinement. So I'm gonna leave this as uh, an open question. Is confinement ubiquitous in the sense that whenever we can even ask the question, we actually uh, can answer and be affirmative for small numbers of flavors. The second outlook question that I want to leave you with is, is global symmetry breaking ubiquitous? Because in our way of extrapolating to the non SUSY theory, we saw that um, whenever we have a loop level version of AMSB, it's never the global minimum. The global minimum is always set by tree level AMSB. And tree level AMSB needs a dimensional parameter in the IR superpotential. But that, by definition, cannot happen at the origin of moduli space. So is this a way of um, nature or math to tell us that in a non susy theory, the um, minimum, the global minimum, always has to be chiral or global symmetry breaking? That would be a pretty uh, interesting thing to say. Alternatively, the IR could be a super conformal fixed point, but then it's also super symmetric. So that's uh, kind of take home thought number two. And the elephant in the, in the room is uh, take home point uh, number three. What is the regime of validity of our results? So we are pretty sure of our analysis because it's just putting A and B and crunching the numbers in the near SUSY limit. And specifically when M is smaller than the dynamical scale of the theory, lambda. But of course, the holy grail is the decoupling, uh, the decoupling limit, yeah, where m is larger than lambda and goes to infinity, in which we can basically say this is not a supersymmetric theory and we are learning something about non supersymmetric strong dynamics. So the key question here is is there or is there not a phase transition when m is roughly the order of the strong coupling scale of the theory? And the truth is, we don't know. But we do have an argument that's convincing to some extent and we are still studying it. Uh, I won't like necessarily uh, bet on it, but it's something to uh, think about and consider seriously. And the argument is based on holomorphy. We want to extrapolate to the infinite Suzy breaking. So let's see, when, when is it that we cannot extrapolate? We cannot extrapolate if on our green path from no Suzy breaking to infinite Suzy breaking, we cross some geometric line, let's call it the phase transition line, which surrounds the origin 
And this is the line along which um, our results don't hold anymore. So the near SUSY phase is completely different from the large SUSY breaking phase. But for that, I need to be able to write a formula for this line. And uh, naively, it'll be a function of the SUSY breaking and of lambda, some sort of uh, curve. But because M and lambda are holomorphic parameters, I cannot write this curve using M star and lambda star. But that means that I can't actually write this phase boundary. So maybe um, I can, in principle, go from the origin here, where there's no SUSY breaking at all, to the large SUSY breaking without going through any phase transition. And I would love to hear thoughts from the audience about this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for question from the audience. Okay, I can, can I make a comment? Of course. Um, let's say you would like to reach QCDA joint with two flavors, okay? So what you suggest is one deformation that's coming from supersymmetric theory on R4. But you have to first generalize uh, QCD-like theory to, to not, to, to supersymmetric theory. There is actually another way. Uh, I don't know if you follow this, but you can study QCD joint on R3 cross, one, cross S1. This is still locally four-dimensional. Mm -hmm. and, and if you impose periodic boundary condition on fermions, this theory does not have a confinement, deconfinement type center symmetry changing phase transition. Actually, in small circle limits, uh, you can, you can uh, show that there is a confinement and this is now due to pairs of monopoles with anti-monopoles, um, which still carry some magnetic charge. And uh, you can show confinement, chiral symmetry breaking and alike. One thing is that, that lattice people checked, for example, in this kind of scenario, you know, there is no uh, holomorphy kind of argument which can allow you to extrapolate between small reduce and large reduce. In your case, it was between small deformation and large deformation. But lattice people checked uh, some of these proposals and there is indeed some, uh, some adiabatic continuity between a regime where confinement is calculable and the strong coupling regime where it is not calculable. That's very interesting. Yeah, I, I wonder uh, if this could be combined with the AMS feed to yield even more powerful results. This is very good. Actually, this can be combined in the following way. One of them is Think of the parameter that enters to uh, AMSP, okay? One parameter is that, the other parameter is radius. And think in this general phase space. Actually, even this allows you to do the following, okay? If you are in large circle limit, the AM, uh, AMSP parameter needs to be small. But if you go to small circle limit, the small circle forces you to weak coupling in the, uh, to weak coupling already, and there is a weak coupling confinement. In that regime, you can take AMSP parameter to be arbitrarily large. You don't oh, need nice. that. Yeah. There is, uh, my, my suspicion is that there is a very interesting adiabatic continuity between this two kinds of constructions. Yeah, I would love to discuss this more. This sounds uh, promising. Now maybe we can chat. I can send you an email. Perfect. Comments, questions?
I have a naive one. Actually, I wonder the discussion about these line operators and confinement, uh, that result seem not seem kind of separate from the earlier discussion. I'm not sure the, the focus of that discussion. Uh, can you can you remind me? Uh, can for you say example, that again? yes, I, I, you have right. You have a section or you have a, a discussion on this line operator and confinement, but uh, I wasn't sure how is that going to. These are kind of like a what. This is a kind of separate topics. This is a topic for sure. This is something you can discuss, but I, I just don't see how is that coherent with the earlier discussion. On maybe the result you show the on AMSB and other. Oh, other sure. Issues. I just I just say okay yeah that, that what you say is true. Um, right. You say about the line operator with this uh, uh this uh, area low or parameter low. And also whether the one one phone symmetry is uh, preserving or breaking, etc. But uh, how is that related to the earlier part of your talk? Maybe I missed the message there. No, no, no. That's a very good point. So, uh, how do you bridge <laughs> the knowledge of whatever condenses in your theory to what the behavior of the line operators are, and what I wrote here is this rule of thumb, right? That you read in, uh, you know, in, in this uh, Aharni Cyber Tachikawa paper, right? You have a particle which condenses, and then there's just the there's just the rule. If it's aligned with the the, char the charges of the non-trivial line operator, then there's screening. If it's not aligned, there's uh, there's confinement. Okay, uh, how to prove this? I would be uh, very interested in, in understanding. This is actually a part of the, the literature that um, I'm, I, I'm not familiar with enough and it really bugged me. It seemed like a, a leap in the logic. I mean, of course, when you, when you read the paper, it's, it's like, uh, that's just a law of nature, but I really wanna understand how you bridge, you extrapolate from whatever the local behavior is to what the behavior of line operators is. And I'm sure the answer is somewhere and it's known by the experts. And if there's any expert in the audience that knows the answer, I'll be very interested in knowing. So I have a, I have a question. Um, I'm trying to make sure I remember correctly the holomorphy argument that you make for phase transitions in supersymmetric contexts. Mm -hmm. The point is that the potential uh, can be written simply in terms of the Kähler potential and the superpotential. And so the condition for a transition can be uh, phrased entirely in terms of the superpotential in the end. And that's a holomorphic function of holomorphic quantities. Once that is no longer true, if that is no longer true, and in particular, I think it relies upon the super, the, the potential actually being zero in a supersymmetric minimum, then I don't know why you would need a holomorphic function of holomorphic quantities for a phase transition. You could have a non-holomorphic function of holomorphic quantities. Um, so if there's an argument that in the AMSB context, you can get around that and you must write a holomorphic function of the holomorphic quantities for any phase transition, that would be the thing you'd need to prove. I understand, I understand the argument. Let me see if I, can we treat uh, the SUSY breaking now as a spurium? So now instead of writing M, let's write the whole Compensator. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So, so now I think if it's a function of the compensator and of lambda, then it doesn't need to be, it, it does need to be a holomorphic function. Well, I mean, it, certain things that are already holomorphic need to be holomorphic functions. But of course, the Kähler potential doesn't need to be. So right. you have to right. prove that the potential, which determines whether there can be a phase transition or not, 
is determined only by the holomorphic functions of the holomorphic quantities and not by the non-holomorphic ones. I agree. I agree. I agree. So it's it's not enough. You're right, you should use the compensator. It is it is the that's the structure you want, but you still have to show that the 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 actual minimum of the theory has to obey a holomorphic principle, which in general a non-supersymmetric deformation of Suzy theories would not be, and it would only be if there's something special about the AMSB deformations that it would be true. Yeah, I, I understand the argument. I, I definitely think that's the right way to, to think about it. Um, I think there can be other issues that are more subtle, but I'd have to think about them and where, where there are um, other non-holomorphic uh, operators get generated, but I'm not sure that actually happens in these theories. Uh, I mean, you're, you're making an assumption here that you could just keep track of the leading term and follow it, but then you have to make sure that there aren't uh, additional effects that come into the RG that just generate additional things that you've left out. Um, and and I, I, again, I'm not sure that happens in theories with just a simple number of fermions and a, and, and a pure gauge theory. Uh, it, it could happen in general, but maybe it doesn't in these cases. Sorry, can you elaborate on, on the generation of extra terms? Because we were... Um, Careful to check that we we can neglect higher order corrections to the Kähler around our minimum. We always basically check that we're at an effectively uh, weakly coupled minimum when speaking in terms of the correct degrees of freedom. Uh, I, I'm I'm not objecting in any way to to the analysis that you've done for small enough m. I think the question is whether uh, once m gets big enough and you're you're far from the Suzy flow, whether there are there are some subtleties. Yeah, but, yeah, but I haven't, I'm, I'm only raising this as a concern in some sort of generalized sense. I don't have, I haven't thought about this enough to remember any specific example. And I, I completely agree. And this is why whenever I introduce this argument, I, <laughs> I say take it with a grain of salt because we're still thinking, we're trying to poke holes in our own argument, and uh, and uh, we are very appreciative of uh, help in poking these holes. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? That, that is thank Alfred first, and we'll see when the people last, last day around. But thank you. Thank you, Alfred. Thank you so much. Bye -bye.